Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to go over persuasive speaking. This is the final lecture in our course and this type of speech, persuasive speech or the motivational speech, the same thing, is the most important type of speech that you can learn about. The reason is because this is the speech that you give on a daily basis. You don't even realize that you're doing it, but you are doing it every single day. When you try to sell somebody Girl Scout cookies, when you try to get a job, when you try to convince you somebody to lend you five dollars, whatever the reason is, or whatever the motivation is, this is the speech that you give on a daily basis without even realizing it. So my aim today is to try to help you understand how it is that you do it, why it is that you do it, and how to improve on the ways that you do it. So the goals of any persuasive speaker are to win over listeners, this one seems very obvious, also to know your subject thoroughly. You can always get caught out with not knowing something and as long as you have a decent amount of knowledge behind you and you've done your research, you have ways to prove your point, then you can come across as a credible person and still say, I don't know. If you haven't done any research, you don't know your subject, then you probably shouldn't be speaking about it, especially not in a persuasive manner. And finally, to maintain a high standard of ethical behavior. Some of the best speakers in recent history uh, and also in past history are really good at speaking, they're really good at persuading people, but it's propaganda. Um, and that is not what we are hoping for you to use this for. We would like for you to use persuasive speech in an ethical manner. There are a couple different types of persuasive speeches. Um, I'm going to go through those two types and also tell you a little bit about um, kind of a subtopic of one of those types. So let's get started with that. The first type of persuasive speech that I want to talk about is a speech to influence thinking. A speech to influence thinking is an oral presentation aimed at winning intellectual assent from, for a concept or proposition. So basically this is just what it says, you are trying to influence your audience. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're trying to motivate them to go out and change something or do something, put something into action. You're simply just trying to change their mind. Some examples of purpose statements that might be used for a speech of this kind, to convince my audience that hiring mothers part-time is a good way to enhance the workforce. So I'm trying to change your mind or reaffirm what you already believe. But I'm not actually telling you, tomorrow I would like for you to call up Workforce One and find some mothers and hire them. That's not my aim. My aim is simply just to change your mind or reaffirm what you already believe. And the second one, to convince my audience that immigrants continue to enrich American society and business life. Again, trying to change your mind, not necessarily trying to make you do anything today. The second type is a speech to motivate action. And this is an oral presentation that tries to impel listeners to take action. So this is just what I was talking about. This is where you are trying to persuade your audience of something and make them take action based on that persuasion today. So some purpose statement examples might be to persuade my audience to leave credit cards behind and start using cash. Or to persuade my audience to sign a petition aimed at requiring drivers aged 70 and over to be retested annually. Taking that first example and building upon that, some suggestions for getting that action because when you do get, when you do try to motivate somebody, you want them to be motivated as soon as possible. And so some ways that you could do that, number one, ask for the action and be clear. A lot of people fall into this trap where they feel shy for asking somebody to do something. If you're here and you're giving a speech, you're already nervous, you put this research into it, ask for the action. Because if you don't ask for it, some people may walk away and go, great speech, it really makes me want to do something, but I'm not going to. Because you didn't tell them to go and do it. An example, based on this first um, purpose statement that I've put here, I would like you, my audience, to visit the ATM and take out $20 on your way home today. 
So I've told them what I want them to do. Once I've told them why, I'm now telling them exactly what I want them to do and I'm telling them when I want them to do it. I want them to do it today. Another, another suggestion, give them all the tools they need to complete the action. So you could tell them to go to the ATM, but a better way to do this is tell them where the nearest ATM is. The nearest ATM is on 8th Street, right across from this building. Right as I'm speaking now, I'm handing out directions to each of the major banks in this area. So now I've told them what I want them to do. I've told them when I want to, them to do it. I've made it so easy for them. I've told them exactly where they need to go. And there's a good chance that they're going to do it now because I've made it easy for them. It's Marketing 101. You can put a website out there, but if you don't tell people what, they, what you want them to do with that website, it's just sitting out there. It's not really doing anything at all. The third suggestion for getting them motivated is manage your expectations. Again, going back to this uh, leaving credit cards behind example, don't, ex don't expect your audience to cut up the credit card right in front of you. Manage your expectations. Asking someone to do something so harsh will ruin your credibility. People will sign things, they'll take down numbers, they'll perhaps even taste something or try something out in front of you. Don't expect them to jeopardize themselves. You don't know how much cash they have in their pocket. You don't know if they need that credit card. Don't embarrass them. Don't jeopardize themselves. If you expect somebody to do something, it's a dangerous thing because you could end up looking like an idiot yourself because they refuse to do it. And it also ruins your credibility by making you seem ridiculous. And so therefore the rest of your speech is out the window. So before you ask somebody to do something, manage your expectations by asking yourself if you would do the action. Another way to get that motivation is try to get a response before leaving the room. So before you even open the doors, before you even speak, uh, end your speech, ask them to do whatever it is that you want them to do. So ask them to sign the petition. Ask them to sign up for whatever it is that you want them to sign up for. Ask them to raise their hands. Ask them to buy in right there and then in front of you. According to Psychology Press study in 2005, if you persuade a person to take a positive step, you increase that person's commitment to the cause. So once they take that first step, it's increasingly difficult to change that person's mind. In other words, if you ask them to go to the ATM and then tell them, okay, everybody who is going to go to the ATM now, raise your hands. Once they've raised their hands, they've just committed to your motivation. Once they've committed to this cause, they most likely will follow through on it. So that leads me to the first steps to motivate. Like I said, this is when you have the people in your room, when you have your audience in front of you. What are you going to do to make sure that they have committed to your cause. You could ask them to sign a petition or a sign-up sheet. You could ask them to raise their hands. You could ask them to take out their phone and make a phone call or plug in a number. Or you could ask them to do a physical action. Let's say you're telling them the benefits of massage and why they should go for a massage once a month. You could tell them, stand up and practice whatever it is that you just explained to them on the person standing next to them. Once they've actually done this first step, they know that they are committing to it. To step away from our text and uh, classroom just for a second, a real world hint, when you're persuading people in the real world, most likely, I'm, I'm talking about a professional world, most likely you're delivering a sales pitch. Don't deliver a sales pitch without asking for the sale. So this is one of your first steps to motivate. When you're sitting in the conference room and you are presenting your sales material, at the end of the sale don't say thank you so much for having me and just walk out. Ask for the sale. Be bold and follow it through because if you don't ask for it, you could walk out and never hear from them again. Same thing when you are in a sales pitch or an interview, don't leave without gaining some kind of understanding of where you stand and what the next step is. 
So if you're in an interview, we already talked about interviewing a little bit. If you're in an interview, make sure you ask at the end of the interview, how do you think it went? What will be the next step? Should I follow up? Should Who should I follow up with? Ask questions. Now, that being said, know when to quit. Because if you're delivering a sales pitch and you start browbeating people, cornering them, manipulating them, that's ethically incorrect. Again, you are ruining your credibility. You will sink your whole argument. In an interview, you want to come across as likable. You need to build up your credibility. If you ask too many questions, then they are going to be bothered by you. They'll realize they probably don't want to work with you and you sunk your whole interview. So ask the questions, but keep it short. Just one or two questions and that's it. So we talked about the speech to influence thinking and we talked about the speech to motivate action. A speech of refutation is kind of a subtopic, a form of influence spe- thinking speech. And the official um, definition is an oral counter-argument against a concept or proposition put forth by others. In other words, it is a speech that you are going against what somebody has already put out there. So this is a speech that you would see a lot in politics. Um, some purpose statement examples here to persuade my audience to reject the widespread belief that everyone needs to consume eight glasses of water again a day sorry, or to persuade my audience to disbelieve claims by so-called psychics that they are able to communicate with the dead. A speech of refutation is the most difficult type of motivational speeches. It can be incredibly difficult. Even if you look at politicians, they tend to spend more time in the areas they know are leaning their way or the middle of the road areas. Let's take a look at the map that we have. So this is a map of campaign spending for the 2012 presidential race. And the red obviously is Romney spending and this is ad spending and the blue is Obama spending. If you look at Texas, let me just, oops. Texas down here. Um, It's obviously a well-known conservative state. Romney spent almost $4 million in campaign ads there, while Obama spent only $2.5 million. Clearly, Obama knows how difficult it would be to change minds, so he takes the easy way out by going after those middle-of-the-road states, like Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, he spent almost $30 million to Romney's measly $364,000. So when delivering a speech of refutation, you need to consider your audience very carefully. You have to understand that you're most likely not going to change minds entirely. It's always a good goal, but there is that uh, managing expectations that you want to hold on to as well. Um, So You aim for the middle of the rotors, and you need to consider very carefully what would actually change minds. There are two ways we come to a decision when we're presented with a persuasive message. Um, The first way is the central route, which that's supposed to be a straight line, in which we listen carefully, we consider all options, we elaborate mentally, and finally we come to a decision. An example of this is like when I chose a preschool for my children. I spent hours researching, I went and toured all of the schools, I talked to people in the neighborhood, I spent hours planning and mulling over all of the options before coming to a decision. I took the central route. The other way is the peripheral route. And you can see why I'm not an art teacher. This is the way I take when someone asks me about football. I half listen, I respond quickly, I think a little bit about it, but not very much at all. And the reason is, I don't really care about football. Don't tell my husband. I base my decisions on what I think is the most important. I'm going to take the central route, think very carefully, stay focused on my topic. I'm going to consider all options, but I'm going to stay in one path until I come to a final decision if I think it's important. If I don't think it's important, I'm going to kind of skirt around it. I'm going to half listen. I'm going to look for verbal cues based on what the person is telling me and how they're acting when they're telling me. That's what I'm going to make my decision on. I won't think about it afterwards. 
I will just skip right past this. We all do this. We might think for days about which car we're going to buy, but only two minutes about whether we'll buy those wonderful Girl Scout cookies. Why does this matter? It matters because decisions made by the central route are stronger rooted. So once you have persuaded somebody, if you can walk them down a straight path, tell them why they should believe this, if they go along with you the whole time and they do believe it, then it won't change as easily. Once you have that decision in their head, that's the decision they've made, that's the choice they're going to stick with. So we need to use this to our advantage by analyzing our audience, deciding what's important to them, and showing them exactly how what they think is important goes along with our persuasive speech. You walk them through in an organized manner and take them to the end. They will stay with you the whole time if you can do it that way. So this is the opinion continuum. Everybody is going to lay somewhere in this continuum, in the spectrum. And this is what I was talking about with Romney and Obama. Um, it's easy for them to go for the highly in favor, and it's very difficult for them to go to the highly opposed. But what they really want is to grab those people right in the middle. Your target audience is similarly these people right here. The people in favor over here you're going to make them feel reinforced by your speech. The highly opposed over here... <laughs> wonderful star. The highly opposed that are over here may move slightly over towards this way, but the people in the middle are more likely to be open to change. If you already know that your audience is highly in favor, if you're speaking about legalizing gay marriage to a gay community, for example, then you can push them to motivation. If you're in the situation where you know your audience is highly opposed, you may want to take baby steps to plant a seed, just to move them, like I said, this little way. But you don't want to be heckled off the stage by giving them motivation, telling them they need to do something if you know that they're not actually going to do it. Again, manage your expectations. For most of us, our audience is going to be mixed. Remember also, even though I'm talking about being heckled, your audience has elected you as speaker. We spoke about, we spoke about that previously, and so it's highly unlikely that you ever will be heckled if you're respectful of your audience. So, we aim for these people in the middle and adjust if needed. Now let's take a look at how we actually do the convincing. For a persuasive speech, credibility is the most important part of the speech. You can do hours of research, present a compelling speech, but if your credibility is not established correctly, you're doing it for nothing. So we're going to look very closely at the elements of credibility. The first element, and this is all from Aristotle's re rhetoric, um, is logos, the logical reasoning in your credibility. Logical reasoning is basically presenting people the facts, telling them where you got these facts, convincing them that you are a trustworthy source, and um, carrying them along that path with you to the end of your speech where you hopefully will motivate them to do something. You establish your logos and you strengthen your logos by using evidential support. This is why in your outline I'm very strict about having that evidential support, especially in your persuasive speech. If I don't know where you're getting the information from, I might like you and I might want to trust you, but I have no reason to trust you. You haven't told me that anybody else backs you up in this, so you need to have evidential support. You also need to have an organized presentation. If it's not organized, if it's confusing to me, then again, I might like you and I might want to do what you're asking me to do or want to believe what you're asking me to believe, but I didn't follow it. I didn't quite catch it. And many of you have seen this when you're going through your outline or your previous speeches. One of the things that I've said is I didn't catch your three main points. So that's why you really need to work on establishing those three or four three to five main points and making sure they're very clear to your audience because as you're saying them you know what you're saying you wrote the the outline you came up with the idea you did the research to you it all makes perfect sense 
but your audience is only hearing this one time and you want them to go out afterwards and do something for you, change their mind, motivate them to buy something, change something in their life. If they don't remember what it is that you're talking about, then again, you're not doing it for any particular reason. You're just doing it for your own well-being, I suppose. A third way to establish logos is stories, and you'll see this as I go through the other pieces of your credibility. Everybody loves stories. So if you can get your evidential support and turn it into a kind of a story, it will stick with people. If you think about our history, our entire history of not just the U.S., but the entire world is based on stories. The history of religion is all based on stories. That's how we pass things down from generation to generation, and it's why it's so important to human nature, and that's why if you put your evidential support into a story, or your evidential support is a story, people will remember it better. They'll enjoy it more. And finally, credibility is also admitting all of the facts. Some of you actually managed to do this in previous speeches, which is great to see. If you're presenting an idea, let's say um, you're presenting a particular stance of religion, you may want to admit that there are some negative aspects to that religion, let's say. So if you avoid it altogether, a lot of your audience may already know that. So they're going to walk away going, yeah, I liked what he said, but he never even talked about this particular aspect, and obviously that's a big deal. So admit all the facts and then counteract on them if you need to. Pathos is the emotional reasoning, and this is when you appeal to your audience's emotions. Most of the time, unfortunately, when this is done, it's done in a negative way. It's appealing to negative emotions. In other words, it's appealing to fear, guilt, shame, anger, or sadness. If you think about the ASPCA ads that you see at Christmas time, you'll see the Sarah McLachlan music in the background. You see all these um, puppies and kittens and horses that have been abused and neglected. This is appealing to your sense of sadness, your guilt, and... Um, your sense of shame. And this, that's one way that we can do it. We can also do it the other way, which is appealing to the audience's positive emotions. So reminding them of perhaps how they felt at better times, and that's a good one for weight loss, for example. You might want to think about, you know, or make your audience think about how they felt when they were healthy, how they felt when they were younger, how they felt when they were fitter and more attractive. And one of the ways to drive this home, whether you use negative emotions or positive emotions, is stories. I'm going to continue to mention stories because it's just such an easy way to connect with the audience. The last part of credibility that I want to talk about is ethos, and that is the appeal to credibility. What that means is how much does the audience like you? Do they believe you because they think that you are looking after their best interests? Do they trust you? Your ethos is your own credibility and some ways that you can build upon that is by being enthusiastic, by being approachable, by being humble, by being um, somebody that your audience can come to, talk to, you don't use words that they don't understand, whether it's slang or whether it's talking above their heads. You also try to find common ground between yourself and your audience. And yet again, another way that you can do this is by telling stories. You can remind them perhaps of childhood things that maybe, the, you know, you think that most people went through, things that you have that are in common, things that you have that are cultural things such as TV shows you watched when you were a kid or um, schools that school experiences that you all had maybe sitting for the SAT something like that this is your common ground you're telling these people I'm just like you and that's why you should believe me when we talk about motivating an audience one of the most important things to keep in mind as you put together your research and start to plan out your speech or your presentation, if this is a business presentation, 
is what's in it for your audience? What is their incentive to do whatever it is that you want them to do? And this brings us Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, I'm sure this is not completely new to most of you. Maslow stated that any individual has a certain amount of needs that will see them through life uh, and determine whether or not they are happy. The things below the yellow line were things that are imperative to anybody's well-being, and that would be family or friends, um, a roof over your head, which is safety and security, roof slash safety, and food, water, things like that. Those are the things that you absolutely need to have to get through life. The things above, oops, sorry. The things above in this section up here are more tangible items. Things like um, having a nice car, being beautiful, feeling good about yourself, so having a good self-awareness. And if you think about it from a job point of view, when you go for an interview, um, the most important thing, obviously, when you go in that interview and you determine whether you want this job, are the things down here. When you actually get the job, one of the things, one of the ways in which they may reward you, are things like certificates. Oh, here's a great certificate. You did a good job, so we're going to give you the certificate. You can hang it on your wall in your cubicle. Fabulous. Looks good on the cubicle. People might ask why you got it, and you feel good about yourself for a few minutes. But it doesn't put a roof over your head, it doesn't feed your family, and it doesn't keep your family. So while it's very good, and it can keep you feeling good for five minutes, it's not going to keep you in that job long term. And the same goes for a speech. If you really need to motivate somebody to do something, you want to appeal to... You want to appeal to this section. How is this going to improve their family? How is this going to improve their safety and security? How is this going to improve their physiological needs, their food, their water, their sunshine? And if you can't do that, then you're going to have to go up to this section and improve the things that they may look for or strive for in life? How can you improve their looks to give them the impression of being beautiful if they aren't already? How can you um, improve their status symbol uh, or their status in society rather? So when you're looking at a speech again try to aim for this section down here in order to incentivize your audience. Okay, let's move on to layouts for persuasive speeches. There are layouts specifically for persuasive speeches, and these are going to help your audience to follow along your speech, remember your topic, and act appropriately. In other words, be motivated to do whatever it is you're asking them to do. For your speeches, you are required to use one of these layouts with a bibliography attached. You're going to see the example of the layouts in the doc sharing section. They don't have a bibliography attached. You do need to have your bibliography attached because you have three credible sources and I need to see who those sources are. The main differences between a persuasive speech layout and other layouts, or other outlines rather, are for one, your preview cannot always include all of the information because you can't tell someone the problem and the solution in your introduction. If you did that, then you'd be making the rest of your speech inconsequential. Inconsequential. Another reason is your organization is crucial. You have to allow your audience to follow along easily and retain the information. So you must make sure that your outline is impeccable. It has to be extremely organized. And the third thing that's different between persuasive speeches and other uh, other speech organizations or other speech outlines is that without evidential support, your audience will not agree with you. So when you're talking about an informational speech, you can tell them um, why cotton is good, 
But if you're trying to persuade them to buy only cotton, you're going to need evidential support. You can't expect your audience to just hear what you say and take it for granted. You have to have that evidential support in your outline, in your speech. So the so motivated sequence is the first outline layout we're going to look at. It's a very easy one to follow along with. The first step is grabbing the audience's attention. This is always easy when you're trying to persuade somebody of something because you have to have a reason to persuade them and so that's where your attention getter is going to come in. Your need is describing the problem that needs action. Satisfaction is satisfying the need by presenting a solution. Visualizing it is helping the audience visualize the results, so you want to use a lot of colorful language in this section. Help them to actually see the thing in their mind happening and happening successfully. And then action is requesting the audience action. That's where you actually have the motivated part. The second type of outline to use for a persuasive speech is the problem, solution, action pattern. And I'm actually just noticing that there is a bullet point missing on here. So let me put that in. Okay, so the problem solution action pattern is um, the way that you show that a problem exists and then you present the solution and obviously ask the audience to take action. This pattern is especially effective when listeners either don't know about the problem or they don't realize how serious it is. So you go through the specific purpose of your speech, you go through the central idea, and present the main points, which are your problem followed by the solution, and then finally ask them for action. One thing to keep in mind before you ask for action Make sure that you summarize the problems and solutions once again so that way it sticks in your audience's head. So the next layout for your outline could be the comparative advantages pattern. And this is a good one when you have more than one option. You already know that your audience agrees with you in principle, but maybe you haven't figured out the solution yet. So this uh, pattern shows that one solution is superior to others. Um, and here's the layout, it's the specific purpose, followed by the central idea, which is where you lay out the opposing views and explain your intent. And then you go through your main points, which would be advantage one, advantage two, advantage three. And then your conclusion is the same as normal. You review your main points and ask for the action. So there are some other layouts for outlines. I haven't gone through them. Um, there's actually so many that I wouldn't possibly have chance to go through all of them. But I've gone through the most important ones and the ones that I recommend that you use. Your book does mention a couple of others in case you want to look further into that. Um, before we leave each other for motivated or persuasive speeches, one thing I wanted to talk about is just how relevant this is in the real world, and by that I mean the world of business. And it is the most prevalent type of speech that you will give throughout the rest of your life. And out in the real world, I hate to use that expression, but I think you understand what I mean, the aim of persuasion is not just for the length of one speech, it's long term. You're trying to change somebody's mind. So while you might be giving a presentation or a speech, to do so, don't give up. Just because somebody doesn't say yes the first time doesn't mean that they won't say yes the third or fourth time. And also when you're thinking about that, if you do manage to persuade somebody of something the first time around, keep in mind that you want them to be persuaded of that for the long haul. So if you're trying to persuade somebody to buy a Ford, you're not just trying to persuade them to buy a Ford today. You're hopefully going to persuade them to buy a Ford today and come back to you when they want to change out their next car too. So keep that in mind. Also, persuasion affects your own hierarchy of needs. So when you're giving a persuasive presentation out in the real world, it's just as important to take into consideration how important this is to you. Most of the time you're looking to make a sale and obviously that is going to affect your 
your hierarchy of needs in that you need to feed your family. So hopefully this will help you to take this particular speech very seriously and, and I hope that what I've presented to you today and also throughout this class will help that in the future. Um, the, th the last thing I, I need to mention is that adjusting to your audience is a necessity throughout any speech, whatever the context, whatever the um, purpose of your speech is, you will need to adjust to, to your audience. And that's one thing that we haven't been able to do too much in this class because we are doing it through webcams. But it's always important to un get an understanding as best as you can before you go in of your audience. And then from there, adjust as, ne as needed. Um, one of the ways that you can do that is to engage your audience. Ask them questions. Literally in the middle of your speech, you could ask them questions, but you need to make sure that you already know the aunt. So an example of that might be, how many of you in here remember the show Saved by the Bell? If you're speaking to a group of teenagers, you're going to get a lot of blank faces. So try to find out who your audience is, find out what as much of as possible about them and based on that try to engage them using questions that you already know how they're going to answer. And that brings us to the end of motivated speeches.